Hi. About 17 years ago, I heard a sound, and that sound completely changed my relationship with technology. It was this sound. Did you know this was the Yahoo Messenger sign-in sound back in early 2000? <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, I felt so bad and stupid of myself opening the door for this sound. <laughs> but you know, if you really think about it, what I did wasn't that stupid. And what do you expect me to do when you hear a door knocking sound? Do you expect me to look at the screen or do you expect me to go to the door and open the door? So it wasn't that bad. So this is an example of technology wanting you to do one thing and you do something else. The technology usually doesn't you know, really leverage on what we are capable of doing as humans. Let me demonstrate this to you. Let's do a quick experiment. If you're holding on to your drink, you know, put it aside. We need both hands for this. <laughs> Grab your smartphones. I'm sure most of you have one, at least one. Some of you may have more than one. Just grab, a, grab your smartphone, unlock the screen, unlock the screen and go to a you know, page where you have so many apps. One of those screens you have you know, 10, 12 apps. Right? And then pick an app that you like. It could be your Facebook, could be WhatsApp, could be Calendar, whatever it is. Just pick one that you, that you like. Hold the phone with one hand. And then everyone look at me. So hold the phone with one hand, look at me, and raise your other hand, the, the free hand. And then close your eyes and use that hand you are raising to tap the icon of that app that you picked. Try and tap it. How many, how many managed to, to get it? So. So we have lots of humans in the room and, and some not so human, uh, you know, maybe superhuman. But the, the point is, you know, let's just continue to, this, continue to do this experiment. Let's keep your eyes closed. Now try and tap a specific part of your body. Let's say your ear. Can you touch your ear? Can you touch your nose? Can you touch your forehead? Elbow? That's simpler, right? So if you, if you think about it, it, isn't it interesting that we can touch a specific part of our body without thinking very easily? And that capability doesn't extend to this piece of plastic. So, so there is a mismatch between what we are good at humans and the technology, what technology has to offer. This is what my work is focusing on the work we do at Augmented Human Lab really focuses on leveraging on these natural capabilities we have, creating technologies that feels like natural extensions of our body, mind and behavior, allowing us to do things that we typically think we could not do. So what I'll do now is I'll go through several examples that we developed over the last few years. Let's start with copy pasting. You know, that's something that we usually do with digital devices. If you translate that into physical things, you know, transferring physical things, things that we can touch, we can touch, hold, moving them is really easy. You just grab it and pass it to whoever you want to pass it to, right? When it comes to moving intangible things, say a photo from your phone to someone else's phone, you can't just grab it and pass it. That's the next thing. So the question is, why can't we? Why, sh why shouldn't we? Why do we have to learn you know, how to use Dropbox or email or, or Bluetooth, something else? Why can't we just leverage on our natural capability of just grabbing and passing if you want to copy paste digital media? This is what we did about six years ago. Here you'll see I, I have a phone number on a web page. I want to move that to my phone. And I would like to just grab it and drop it to my phone. And that's possible. As you can see, I just grab it as if it's, it's a tangible thing. Drop it to my phone. It gets copied over. Similarly, if I had a movie I need to pass it to my friend, I just grab it and drop it to his phone. 
the technology here is super simple. It just goes to the cloud and comes back. What's more important is the concept, the concept of just leveraging on our natural behavior of just grabbing and moving things. That's the, the point of this work. Let's go back to our experiment, the simple experiment we did. Remember, we could touch our body parts quite easily without looking. And that doesn't extend to the, the piece of plastic we have, right? So what's the point of having all these icons sitting here? Why can't we just take, it, take them out and map them to our body so that we can tap them whenever we want, you know? Why can't we? And we did an example of that. We choose ear as the body location, and we map the music, music player. So by tapping the ear, you can switch on music, you can change your tracks, you can change your volume. So the cool thing about this is, first, you don't have to take your phone out, right? If you're if you jogging, you can just tap and, and change the music and control that without having to take the phone out. But the more powerful part is, this works for people who are sighted as well as who are blind. Because this doesn't rely on the fact that you have to look at the, the device. So talking about blind people, when I was in MIT a few years ago doing my postdoctoral work, there was a colleague. He was blind, he was taking classes with me. So I could see how he, you know, read his notes. He takes his phone out, unlock the screen, browse to his camera app and then takes a picture, and then the reading software reads it out for him. Which was fine, he was, he was able to get his stuff done. But by observing him, I could see there's so many unnecessary steps. You know, why does he have to do these four or five steps every single time when he wants to read something? Why can't he simply point at things that he wants to get informed about, and then have that information? That made us develop the finger reader, which is basically a finger-worn camera. You point at the thing that you're interested, the camera sees it, and there is an intelligence engine that recognizes that picture, and that information gets conveyed to the person as audio through headphones. So with this, a blind person could go to a library, pick a book that he or she wants, and then read the book page by page or line by line. During the next 10 years. We did so many applications, you know, recognizing currency notes, recognizing products, reading restaurant menus. The use cases are not limited to blind people. This could be a tool for language learning, or it could be a tool to translate things, say you are in a Japan and then you wanted to know what this product is, this could be a tool that translates things back to your own language. And even more, this could be a tool for creativity. You know, for example, we did this project where we used the finger reader to seamlessly connect between beauty of nature and the powerfulness of digital devices, seamlessly copying beautiful textures and colors from nature and use them as digital paint. So um, to me this is this is okay, but what really matters is you know to bring this into next level, which is making this into a device that blind people can use on daily basis. It's okay to show these this conceptual things in the lab, but what's really impactful is to bring them out into the hands of people. So we started really designing a product that people can, people can use it on a daily basis. What needed to be done was this camera on ring was too bulky. It wasn't practical. People could not you know, uh, use it as a seamless device. It was always, you know, uh, too bulky and, and you, you feel that it's, it's with you always. What needed to be done was to create this wear and forget device. You just have to wear it and forget about it and it's always there when you need it. So that made us change the form factor 
into something like this. Basically, this is a wireless headset. And it's a headset that has intelligence. It has a camera built into it. So when you wear it, the camera sees what you are seeing. And you can point at something, camera captures that, and then the intelligence built into this and the cloud recognizes that. And these bone conduction headphones will convey the information through your uh, bones without covering the ears. So one thing, it's wear and forget. The second thing is it keeps your ears open to receive other important you know, environmental cues that you need. So this is being set up in New Zealand as a, as a startup. We are collaborating with the, the Blind Foundation and hopefully in the very near future, you will see this in the hands of blind people in New Zealand. I'm not sure how many of you saw this a uh, couple of weeks ago. TV New Zealand in their Sunday program, they captured uh, a moment of this, some experiences with a blind person. We have not engaged him before, but it was so nice to see somebody picking this up for the first time and using and then seeing the usefulness of this. But I'm quite intrigued to see what it's all about. Excellent. For Daniel, seeing is believing. Pop that on your head. And then what you do is you put this on your index finger. <laughs> it is a magazine about seafood. That's quite amazing. It sort of goes through and lists off all the sort of top headlines and stuff like that. Coming to a cafe or a restaurant can be a bit of an issue. Oh, definitely. If I could just sort of point at a, at a menu and it reads it out to me, that'd be amazing. So as I said, hopefully this will be out in the hands of people very soon. If you want to see a live demo of this, one of the guys who's leading this effort in the startup, he's here in the audience. He'll be happy to show you a live demo of this after the talk. So that's the, the IC. Another example of a device that's not being designed in the correct way, a specific example would be these devices that's meant to support deaf swimmers. You know, imagine a competition where there is a deaf guy uh, in, the, in a swimming competition. Obviously, the person don't hear the, 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 the go signal, right? So what we have right now, the state of the art, is this light that looks like an emergency flashing light that sits on the floor. So with this, the guy has to look down, and when the go signal goes, he just has to go that way. It's very awkward in terms of posture. The second thing is, the hearing people, they hear ready and go. They have the anticipation. This guy just looks down till that thing flashes, no anticipation. And then if they want to do an event like a backstroke, the light is not useful at all. So we thought you know, we could do something about it. We designed a light system called SwimSight which is basically a different type of light that's plug and play to any of these professional timing system. And with this, the user can adjust it to his or her comfort location, so you don't have that posture issue anymore. It works for different styles, you know, freestyle or backstroke, it works. And then this has two colors. When, when the, the ready signal is on, it turns amber, when the go signal is on, it turns green. We gave this to, to uh, the Singapore National Deaf Sports Association. Last couple of years, this has been the device that they use in their national deaf games. This is a, a video from, I think this was 2016, the national deaf games in Singapore. The swim site was used as the, as the official timing device. So you can see here, the device turns amber when they get the ready signal. And then it turns red. So another, another part of you know, human behavior is being able to express ourselves, which is sort of very fundamental to us. Even before we, we knew how to write, people were able to sketch things. They were able to express by sketching, drawing, painting. We wanted to you know, augment that capability and add some enhancement to it. You know, for example, how can we allow a person to create 
subtle animations on regular paper. Can that, e can that even be done? This is a, a project we did a few years ago. The idea was you can buy off-the-shelf pens that comes with ink that has this property of changing its color based on temperature. And we develop plug-and-play little modules, so you can sketch with this, these pens, attach these modules behind the paper, and we have a very simple interface to heat and cool these elements, and you can make things appear, disappear on regular paper. It's just three simple steps, as I said. You just sketch what you want to animate on regular paper using these off-the-shelf markers, attach these plug-and-play modules behind, and then instruct it the sequence that you want to heat and cool them. And with this type of people things, we, we got people to create stuff they want to create, and there was really beautiful stuff in this animation. You can see this leaf falling down on a, on a regular paper. There's, there's more things you can do with this. You can screen print them into, into fabrics and other things. So ha having, adding that subtle, extra, temporal dimension to regular things that you can do on, on paper. This is about painting. Another form of expression, obviously, is, is music. Especially for a person who can't hear, how can we allow such a person to experience music as some of the hearing people could? This was my PhD research. The idea was to convert music into vibrations so that a deaf person could feel it. You know, after all, brain is just a pattern recognizer. It doesn't matter whether the sound comes or the information comes from here or through skin. The brain will figure it out. So what we did was we built this wooden structure that, that's more like a chair, and the music was converted to vibration, and somebody sitting on the chair could feel this vibration. And we deployed this in a, in a residential deaf school in Sri Lanka. Now it's been about nine years plus. Even as we speak, this is daytime in Sri Lanka, so they must be using this right now. They can sit on this chair, feel the music, and just like how we, how we form different taste and experience with music, they can form their own experience and, mus and, experience and preferences with music. And we see lots of these type of experiences throughout these years, you know, a profoundly deaf kid sitting on this chair, experiencing music, and, and having this very, very joyful experience. Imagine somebody who has never heard sound. Now, you know, even forming their, their preferences, you know, you can play different music. And, and now, if I go to that school, they will tell me, I like this type, not that type. And if you try to trick them by playing some random noise or speech, they would say, this is not a music that I like. This is something else. And they, they manage to, you know, form that. You just have to give them the right information. An obvious extension to this would be, how do you allow them to play music, right? Listening to music is, is one form, but really playing music would be the way that you would express. So we wanted to tackle that aspect as well. How do you allow a deaf kid to be able to play music? There are the trick is real-time feedback. Because for hearing people, the way we play music is, you know, we, we, we do an action, we hear what we did, and then we make adjustments because we hear that real time for a, for a person who can't hear, that feedback is interrupted. But if you provided them real time feedback through a different mean other than hearing uh, uh, through ears, they could do the same thing. They can perform an action, get feedback, and adjust the action based on the feedback. So we developed uh, this little sensor pair called Moose Bits. It has two parts. One part is a sensor, the other part is the display. The sensor you can place on any music instrument, or you can connect a digital input. It analyzes the audio, 
picks out important musical parameters and then communicate this to the display bit which is a wearable piece a, a deaf person can wear it wherever he or she wants it has visual feedback through these blinking lights as well as it vibrates and these two things do all these things you know sense the sound analyzes them communicate and get the feedback less than 30 milliseconds so it's almost real time you can you can use that feedback to make adjustments and generate music we brought it back to the school and started you know experimenting with them we saw very interesting moments for example in this case these profoundly deaf kids one of them is is playing a simple beat the other guy is able to count the number of beats a simple so he says there's three beats and in this example the guy increases the loudness and the the other kid is able to recognize okay the loudness is being increased so these are these are some of the basic skills but then we also saw moments like a, a profound deaf kid is over time learning how to play instrument and and making his own uh, expressions of rhythm and these are kids again who has never heard sound who has never played an instrument now playing this so these are really really very satisfying moments to see technology enable enabling people to do things that they thought they could not do i guess i've now told you enough stories and and shown you a, a selection of some of our work the real take home message or rather the story i wanted to tell you is the fact that technology is powerful which i guess we all agree but we need to package it properly to make it more meaningful when you package it properly it becomes so natural to use it becomes part of us it augment us to do things better allow us to do things beyond what what we would think our capabilities are so in my vision the augmented future augmented human of the future should not look like this this is not the not the augmented you know human that we want to see we want technology to you know be invisible be be a sort of extension of our natural behavior and make us uh, you know allow us to be more human what that means is technology goes to background help us do do better uh, you know help us do things better in in the way we work we play we communicate and really most importantly ultimately enhance our human to human experiences that's what matters in the end thank you Before we move on, uh, we're going to open the floor now to questions. So if you have any questions for Saranja, uh, just chuck your hand up and he'll pick you and then, yeah, we'll hear and he can answer your questions. So, do we have any questions? There you go. Right. Yeah, you're doing a lot of work at um, giving um, like full abilities to people that don't have them. So what, people who are sighted and people who are deaf. What about... So I guess I probably uh, showed a couple of examples. The copy paste is, you know, it wasn't meant for a for a blind or a deaf or a person having a, a difficulty, right? It was meant to enhance what we do. That's that's one example. Even the 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 paper pixels example, where 
it allows you to create subtle animations on regular paper. So I guess the vision of Augmented Human Lab is not about creating another assistive technology for a special group of people. What we are trying to do is we want to create technologies. You could be in this usability spectrum, people needing help to you know enabling technologies, or it could be technologies to enhance. So we are, we are operating in this whole spectrum. And I guess maybe I, I put a little bit more emphasis on, on some of the projects that's on this side. But if you, if you go to my, uh, our group web page, you will see that we've done a lot of projects along the, the entire axis. Yeah. So I guess as an approach, I firmly believe in this, you know, divergent and convergent thinking approach. And sometimes these these moments, you don't. If you just think about them, sitting in your lab and you're sitting in your room, okay, what can I do? Then it becomes very, you know, assumption based. You just do things that may not be the reality. What really helped us deciding some of the projects was to pay attention, observe, you know, for example, the finger reader project was basically based on observation, seeing a challenge that somebody has to go through, see what you could do as a as an engineer, as a as a uh, design thinker, what could you do, what kind of intervention can you do to help that situation. So most of our work has been inspired by observation, uh, uh, empathizing, empathizing, you know, uh, and, and sort of, if you just ask people what they want, you know, it's it's a quite known thing that people say one thing, do something else, and and feel completely different thing. So we need to have that that our eyes, ears open, pay attention, recognize the opportunities, and sometimes s small changes can create big impact. It's not always about rocket science. It's about you know doing the right intervention that can get the maximum impact. So it, uh, it's it's mostly. Uh, working with the right group of people, having the observation, and then, then having that you know grounding that that made us start some of the projects. Yeah. Um, thanks for the presentation. I yeah. just had one question on um, what would you say would be the biggest challenge that you face when you take a product from concept through to implementation into the real world? Is it, you know, technical? Is it user adaptability, cost, or et cetera? Or what, would, yeah, what would you comment on that? Thanks. So if I, if I take the, the finger reader project, right? I started that 2012. And when we had the first prototype, we were so excited. We thought okay, people are going to just, you know, grab it with both hands. Uh, we had a meeting with the group of blind people, they meet in, in MIT Boston every first Saturday. So we, we went, uh, we had a session reserved and we went all in and then we showed this device. And one thing the very first user said was, this is fine, but I won't use it unless it's as nice and fashionable as my wristwatch. So getting this user acceptance is probably one, I mean, we, we buy things mostly for that, that experience, that value, right? That value doesn't come just because it has this technical capability. It, it comes because it has the right experience. Getting that use experience, the acceptance has been the most challenging part. And we realized that part of that comes through by co-designing. Ra rather than us designing something and force fitting to you, we want to work together. So that's why first thing I did when I came here is to approach the Blind Foundation and I was very happy that they were very open and, and we wanted to work together with them and, and, and solve this challenge together as opposed to me designing and throwing it to you. And, and that way I think we can tackle this biggest challenge we have been facing in terms of how do you design for accept acceptability. your cell phone or any sort of piece of technology um, and you throw away your old technology, you're creating a huge amount of waste. Um, what 
and thought goes into being able to upgrade the software side of your technology without discarding the hardware side of it. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> so if I understand the question correctly, what you are referring to referring is how can we design so that we don't create so much e-waste? Is that your question? Correct. I guess, you know, <coughs> I can share my thoughts. Mm, this is not probably the, my core area of expertise. But I believe, you know, one of the issues of creating e-waste is because we haven't designed things in the right way. So, you know, the next thing comes, we throw away this and then grab the next one. Probably a, a, a right way to design would be things that evolve together with us. You know, there was a very nice example I've seen. Uh, there was this guy who designed these clothes that grows with you, so that you don't have to throw it away. So what if you had a, what if, what if you had a, you know, uh, interface? As you, as your body changes, it also adapts to yourself, so that this issue of having to throw away and get another one won't appear that much. So I, I guess, as I said, this is not my core expertise, but I guess the way to think about this would be creating things that evolves with you. Yep. Right. Let's do question one. Yeah. Uh, go for it. Um, obviously we've got an aging population. Yeah. Which means an increased number of people with cognitive impairment. And I just wonder if you had any experience in uh, working with people with cognitive impairment who are losing skills but could probably still respond to triggers. Um, and if anyone's working in that area? So, we started looking into that little bit. There's a, I think maybe that person is here, one of my PhD students, uh, she's looking at, uh, specifically looking at memory, and right now she's running an experiment to see how we can support a, a person, a sort of aging person, I think we are looking at between 50 to 70, how can we support <coughs> the person to be, uh, you know, have a have a uh, better skill set in terms of memory capabilities? Looking at the perspective memory, when you when you want to form intentions, I want to do this. If I see that, I want to go out for shopping. If I saw this person, I need to do this thing. Or if I'm looking for this thing, if I saw something else, I need to remind myself to do this other thing. She's running these experiments with a group of 12 people over two weeks to see how we can come up with a, a digital strategy. And, and here, the, 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 the very nice part about this study is we are creating a tool, but we design the tool such a way that you don't become over-dependent on the tool. So after that training, what we expect is even without the tool, you'll be better with your memory. Because you know, with these devices, what has happened is how many phone numbers do you remember now? Nothing, right? So we don't want to go there, you know. You don't want to be totally lost if there's a, if the tool is gone away. But this is about using the tool to train you to be better at your own skill. And, and that's just the starting point because I see a lot of potential in this aging in place concept and we needed to start somewhere. We thought maybe start with, with memory augmentation. If she's around, maybe you can have a greater chat with her later on. Uh, there was a question somewhere there. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, you developed a device for blind people and also for deaf people. Do you think you can somehow change the education system for the kids that are blind and they are deaf? Because I think for them should be really difficult um, to have the same experience. I mean, for sure, they uh, won't have the same experience as the normal people, but what you said here probably will help the kids to have more, uh, the experience more close to the normal people. What do you think about that? Do you think that uh, your device will help in that direction? Because I saw you also used your device more for the children in Sri Lanka or something. So I think fundamentally, fundamentally uh, there's no such thing Normal people are better. These people are, uh, you know, 
Yeah, but you know, my experience, I've been working with these deaf kids in Sri Lanka for over 10 years, right? Apart from, let's say, let's say a skill uh, that needs hearing, say, uh, maybe music and maybe dancing, apart from these two, if you taught them things like math, science, uh, graphic design, they can, I can put my money, they can outbeat, you know, very easily some of these hearing kids, quite easily. And what happens is, at least in Sri Lanka, people associate the deafness with intellectual disability. And there's, n there's, there's no such thing. Being deaf is you just don't hear. And maybe sometimes that's better because you have much more <laughs> space in your brain to deal with other things. And, and you know, seriously, the, some of the, the amazing artists, amazing designers are people, you know, who have this some sort of you know limitation. And by having that limitation, you, you open up more space. You know, sometimes with all these senses open, our brain is, is crowded too much. And so I think what needed to be done is really create these, these platforms, interfaces, to provide them the right information. And if you did that right from the beginning, there's no reason why they can't you know, do, do uh, better, even better than what some of us can, can do. In fact, uh, I've been working with one guy who's deaf, creates amazing graphic designs. Yeah, so yeah, it's just a matter of giving them the right information at the right from the beginning. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a question um, about the involvement of technology. So say, you know, roughly 40 years ago, nobody knew the World Wide Web was going to be, you know, widely used every day by millions of people. And then we, you know, evolved into a desktop. And, um, you know, 20 years ago, all the teenagers had a pages that, you know, were popular for a few years and then got replaced by cell phones. So currently, I think we're at the stage where cell phones and iWatch is the technology that, you know, is the most uh, popular. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think we are going to have in another 10 years, either hardware <laughs> or software? Wow. That's a, that's a hard question. I wish I, I knew the answer. But, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. So the technology is, is really evolving very fast, then that's why I, I like to think about, you know, when you solve a problem, if you just focus on a technology and, and claim that, okay, I build this technology, you're going to be obsolete sooner than you think. So we need to just ask ourselves, what's the concept? That's why I was highlighting the concept of creating these, these you know, seamless interfaces. Now, if you, if you really think about this, the guy who did the, the Walkman, if he said, oh, I developed the Walkman, he would have been obsolete when the CD men came or when the iPods came, right? But if you frame what you're working on as a, a more conceptual challenge, oh, can we think of portable music? Then it doesn't matter what the technology is, right? Different technologies will allow us to implement that in different ways. But the, the concept of portable music still holds, whether it's from uh, Walkman or CD player or it's an iPod, or it's cloud, doesn't matter. So that's why I like to think about, not, not about specifically what the technology is. The implementation depends on what's available. But what we really need to think about is, how do we think of these interactions, the interfacing between us and the technology, so that it becomes very seamless. When we, when we had you know, mostly smartphones, 29, 2009, we focus on this copy pasting using smartphones. When we had smart watches, we started thinking of how can we seamlessly monitor somebody's, you know, emotional, physiological state and use that as a way of, you know, creating different interactions, enabling people to be better aware of their, their physiological and emotional state. So the technology will enable us to implement some of these things, but I guess Fundamentally, the fact that this, this abstraction of technology is such a way that it allows us to be in the front where technology goes to the, the background, that's, that won't go away even after 10 years. So, so the way I think about this is technology as an as a enabler, and the outcome would be 
enhancing our human experience. The way we implement that depends on what's available in that era. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk tonight. I have two visually impaired adult children, so I'm very interested in the um, availability of the headset. Yeah. And uh, what sort of cost is going to be involved? So and when? <laughs> so there's a, there's a guy back over there, Roger. He's running the startup. And you should definitely talk to him. And he'll give you a demo. Plus, he can share all this information with you. Yeah. Um, just one thing quickly. I've noticed a lot recently that more and more people are starting to, well, it's starting to crop up of people wanting to push away from technology. I saw something the other day about switching your cell phone to black and white mode to try and break a phone addiction kind of thing. Um, is this something that is brewing um, more than just inside my scope? Like, is, is there generally a push away from technology from a wider audience? And how do you see that affecting your technology, which seems to be you know, taking on more things in your life? Do you think that's something that's going to be a challenge for you moving forward? So I guess part of the, the reason for that that sort of tension between technology and people is there has been two paradigms of technology. One is we use the technology literally as a tool. You know, this is a tool. I have to tell it what to do. I need to Google and, and it will tell me the, the result or I need to go to the weather app. It will tell me the weather. So that's a, it's almost, you can think of this is a hammer, but it's a smarter hammer, right? That's a very passive paradigm. And then became more of an active paradigm where you have these voice-enabled services like, like Siri or Amazon Alexia, Google Voice, where you just instruct it and it's always listening to you. With this, you have this issue of them taking your attention away, they are being not discreet, and you wanted to avoid them. And this third paradigm we are talking is sort of technology becoming a mediator between you and the environment, because as a person, What's important for you is decision making, your emotions, your memory, uh, your communication, these things. And then, then your actions on the environment. So if the technology sort of act as a, as, a, as a mediator in between, without you having to explicitly tell it what to do, or you know, just shout it out to it all the time, then there'll be more acceptance. Because what we are trying to do is, in a way, hide the technology as much as possible. So if you had this technology in a, in a very explicit way, people will eventually find ways to you know, not use them that much. And you think of this as an addiction. But if you hide the technology so that it's sort of in the background, just giving you the information or the, the, the things at the right time, then I don't think this tension will be as much as what we have now. All right, brilliant. Thank you all for your lovely questions. Uh, can we just get a really large round of applause for Saranja? Because that was amazing. Thank you.